I'd like to introduce you to Emilio um, Concari. He was Sue Muller's intern last year. Did a great job. Um, he's a student at UMBC and he grew up in Eldersburg, Maryland. He will be graduating in December. And um, he's an all around naturalist. He's uh, interested in birds and he's also expanded to herps, fishing, mushrooms and aquatic ecosystems and nature photography. Um, he's uh, pursuing a degree in environmental studies and has to become a naturalist or environmental indicator. Uh, without further ado, let me introduce you to Emilio and his talk on creek ecosystems and the importance uh, for breeding birds in aquatic life. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. Hello, everybody. Um, let me just pull up the presentation real quick. Just okay. going to interrupt you just real quick, one second, for people sure. that don't know how to operate Zoom. If you go to the top, you can do the settings and uh, in speaker view so that you don't see all the tiles and you just see the speaker. Go ahead. Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, Y'all can see this, I assume. No problems. Yep. Great. Yep. Okay. Good. Uh, so, uh, yeah. Hello. My name is uh, Emilio Kincari. Uh I'll be doing a presentation today about the importance of creek ecosystems uh, for aquatic life and breeding birds. Uh, I'll be, of course, narrowing things down to to Maryland only. Uh, more specifically, the Piedmont region. Um, I figured that'd be most relevant since this is the Howard County Bird Club. So without further ado, let's begin. Uh, here's, you can see a sort of basic diagram that displays the um, interconnectedness of creek ecosystems. This is a, something akin to what you would see in a school classroom. Uh, lots of arrows pointing all over the place. However, this doesn't even really scratch the surface of how vastly interconnected and important these, these ecosystems are, not just for resident and migratory species, uh, but also for the, entire, the entirety of the Chesapeake Bay and by extension, the state of Maryland's overall environmental health. Uh, now, after seeing that, you might be thinking, but Amelia, this isn't a classroom, so... Why are we learning about this topic? Uh, or you might also ask, sure, creeks are important, but I already kind of knew that. Uh, well, sure, these are reasonable questions uh, to raise, but hear me out, of course, because some aspects of this presentation might certainly surprise you. At the very least, this presentation will uh, reiterate to you the importance of creek e ecosystems and why they should continue to be protected and cherished. Um, my goal here is to try to expand your points of view about this topic. And even if you've learned only a single thing during this presentation, that's a, su a success in my eyes. So, and hey, uh, on the other side of things, if any of you don't know much about this topic, then I'm happy to be the one to teach you. So um, let's get going with the benthic macroinvertebrates. Uh, found along the bottom of these creeks, as the name benthic sort of implies. Uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with these. Very, very important. Um, we will get into their importance sort of later. Uh, and then, of course, we have the adult versions. Um, very popular food source for creek denizens as larvae and as uh, adults especially in spring, um, excluding the odonates, which are the dragonflies and the damselflies. Most of these uh, do not feed as adults. Uh, mayflies, stoneflies, and dobsonflies are um, very, very important for, for analyzing and judging high quality streams. Uh, and we'll detail more about that later. <coughs> something that a lot of people don't really uh, expect 
in, in these sorts of presentations would be um, aquatic moths, but they are uh, fairly prevalent in these habitats. Um, there's a handful mostly in the family um, Ascentropinae. Uh, the larval stages are actually aquatic uh, and they have gills. Um, they're, these are of course uh, very important food sources for a lot of different creek denizens. And the adults are very important nocturnal pollinators along with all the other moths. So very important, not, not exactly this, the, the largest, um, the largest piece of the puzzle here, but still very important. And then you have one of my favorites, which are crayfish, uh, creeks and streams, very, very popular uh, habitats for native crayfish, particularly. You have Allegheny crayfish, common, spiny cheek, white river, rock and assuming it. Um, all can be found in, in creeks or stream habitats. Even the smallest uh, seepage habitats can, can hold crayfish. Uh, and they're very, very important indicator species. They're also voracious predators, very, very important for sustaining these sort of small um, uh, micro habitats around the, these uh, areas. And then you have the invasive crayfish, with, like the red swamp crayfish, feral, rusty, uh, well-known, very, very invasive, highly adaptable, can survive in a lot of different aquatic habitats, including streams uh, and creeks. All three can outcompete natives, but they don't necessarily pose a significant threat to the balance of these habitats. Um, they do serve as a very important food source for a lot of these denizens and they grow larger than our native crayfish so very popular. Apologies uh, to the arachnophobes <laughs> in the audience but uh, of course we have to go over the aquatic spiders uh, particularly in the genus Dolomedes. Very skilled hunters uh, can even nab small fish and of course they're, they're a nice food source for for some of the uh, predators here. Now that we've sort of gone over the invertebrate denizens, we can sort of detail the vertebrate denizens. A lot of these tend to be very popular, <laughs> uh, starting with fish, which are very, very important food sources and indicator species in these habitats. You have uh, black-nosed dace on the right, which can be found almost in any stream, regardless of um, water quality, they're very pollution tolerant. And then you have rosy side dace on the right, which are very pollution intolerant. It can only be found in, in very, very healthy, unpolluted streams. Now you have the bottom feeders, which are very often found in high quality streams. Um, very good indicator species for that. They rely upon the benthic macroinvertebrates that, that I mentioned previously um, as a food source, obviously. <clears throat> Found in all sorts of different habitats. These include sculpins and suckers and darters, um, small catfish like mad toms, and a few more. Uh, now, of course, you have the open water hunters as well, which eat these previous species like smallmouth bass and fall fish and the occasional trout, depending on the area that you're in, uh, and chain pickerel if you're a little closer to the uh, bay. Uh, even creek chubs, which are, are very, very small compared to most uh, predators in sort of larger creeks, um, can be the apex predators in small streams. Uh, and of course, for the herpers out there, the reptiles are among uh, every, everybody's favorites, really. Everybody seems to like at least turtles. <laughs> People do seem to like turtles a lot. And um, speaking of which, we have, as you can see there, common snapping turtle. Very, very, very common in these sort of creek habitats. Um, and you have some rarities like spotted turtles and wood turtles that are found in 
um, more pristine habitats. Reptiles as a general rule aren't terribly uh, pollution intolerant, but there are some that indirectly require uh, healthy streams. Um, you have uh, snakes, obviously, like northern water snakes and uh, the occasional garter and queen snake. Um, queen snakes rely heavily on crayfish that we very uh, briefly mentioned before uh, and have benefited a lot from the invasives, surprisingly. Uh, and these are also very important food source for a lot of birds like kingfishers, birds of prey, herons, um, a lot of these really like snakes and have even been seen eating turtles, which we'll get into later. And of course, we have the amphibians next. Uh, these support, creeks support a wide variety of amphibian life, specifically the adults. Um, you know, as many of you know, uh, amphibians tend to breed in ephemeral or vernal pools, and then they, they migrate to sort of different habitats uh, particularly creeks and small streams and seep seepages uh, as adults, including red spotted newts um, and a lot of the frogs like the ronids and the chorus frogs. Uh, and these are, again, very important food sources for corvids and birds of prey and herons and ducks and kingfishers, even some woodpeckers. That might surprise you, but we'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, well, not <laughs> sooner than I expected. Uh, now we'll get into the birds uh, appropriately because this is the bird club, it's about time. So we have red-bellied woodpeckers, which you probably wouldn't expect that these were on the list, but they are. Uh, obviously they enjoy eating fruit and seeds and nuts, tree sap, wide variety of invertebrates in trees. However, they have been observed uh, commonly eating lizards, snakes, tree frogs, fish, nestling birds, and even bird eggs. So they actually very, very heavily rely on creek habitats, particularly during the breeding season to feed their young, you know, having a, a large tree frog, comparatively large to their size, to feed your young is a pretty crucial food source there. And there's water thrushes, Louisiana, northern water thrush. They're pretty much totally evolved to being in these sorts of areas. Heavily, heavily rely upon the benthic macroinvertebrates that we mentioned previously. Very commonly observed rock hopping, excuse me, and uh, catching aquatic insects. And prothonotary warblers, uh, of course, also very much rely on these habitats for breeding as do water thrushes. They breed on the edges of creeks. Um, there's a photo on the left there of a uh, fledgling prothonotary warbler a few years ago um, at, uh, I believe, Susquehanna State Park. I remember seeing him fledge and he fell into the water and had to swim to the shore and the parent was was freaking out the whole time, but that that's how these uh, that's how the, this species really lives. They're very much adapted to living in sort of riparian zones close to larger rivers where there's sort of streams or smaller sort of flowing water nearby for breeding. And they, uh, of course, rep uh, heavily rely on aquatic macro invertebrates, uh, uh, the adults and the larva to feed their young. And then there's flycatchers. A lot of people know about these guys. Willow flycatchers and Phoebes particularly really enjoy uh, these sorts of creek and stream habitats. You'll see them near, near these habitats a lot. A few weeks ago, I saw an Eastern Phoebe dive into the water <laughs> to catch um, some small insects. Very fond of macroinvertebrates. They, they love jumping up into the sky and um, and nabbing them right out the air, especially during, during hatches. Macroinvertebrate hatches are very, very important, as I mentioned earlier. And you wouldn't really expect tree swallows to be on here either, but they do very much rely on creek and stream habitats. They rely on 
you know, a lot of the insect aquatic macroinvertebrate hatches, rather, that we mentioned, mayflies, stoneflies, caddisflies, dragonflies, damselflies, all very popular swallow food. And surprisingly, many of you may not have known this, but they actually eat fish bones, crayfish exoskeletons, and clam shells during the breeding season as a source of calcium. So these creek habitats are very important for them in a variety of ways. And another very strange one you wouldn't think to see on here, Eastern bluebirds. Very, very odd. The ever lovable bluebird benefits from these habitats as well. They of course eat adult macroinvertebrates. They've been seen catching them out of the air. Very important food sources. But just like some of the other birds on here, they have been observed on multiple occasions, although rarely, uh, catching small frogs, lizards, salamanders, and even small snakes, which they use to feed their young, particularly in the breeding season, very similar to some other species that we saw. Again, having, having a large, comparatively large meal like a spring peeper to feed your young is very, very beneficial. And the classic belted kingfisher, of course, very, very heavily reliant on these habitats. They are fully adapted for these sorts of areas. Um, wide variety of food sources that they eat. Crayfish, frogs, snakes, turtles, insects, young birds, mice, and even some fruit. They often use eroded stream banks for nesting. So uh, interestingly, in a even slightly polluted um, or eroded sort of creek. They can benefit from erosion, which we'll get into erosion a little bit more later. And there's spotted sandpipers, very also very heavily reliant, um, adapted for these sorts of places. You'll often see them around very reliant on macroinvertebrates, similar manner to water thrushes, Similar hunting strategies, they'll even eat some uh, fish and crustaceans as well. And birds of prey, of course. <laughs> These very much benefit from creek habitats. You'll see that red-shouldered hawk on the left with a bullfrog. Uh, that was last year, I watched it catch and eat that big old bullfrog. Very, very important for this time of year to get them all full and uh, obviously for feeding their young. You'll even have black vultures sort of do the same thing. They'll catch fish and crayfish and frogs, snakes, even some turtles, as will red-shouldered hawks. Very surprising, but they do rely on these sorts of areas. Vultures, you know, turkey vultures, very strict scavengers, but black vultures will actually go out and hunt more if you did not know. And of course you have barred owl, very well known that they rely on these habitats. They catch fish and crayfish, frogs, snakes, turtles, lots of different larger vertebrate denizens. Uh, they, and they're often very, very, they're very often seen nesting around these creek habitats or just aquatic habitats in general. And there's the rest of the water birds like the anodids, the ardeids, the rollids um, that very, very often frequent these habitats and also rely upon them for food and breeding. And uh, as Sue mentioned earlier, heron rookeries tend to be very close. You know, I have some smaller herons like green herons very frequently seen here and hooded mergansers as you see on the left. Very, very common in creek habitats as well. Now that we've sort of moved away from the animals, I have to give the plants the spotlight obviously. Let me have a drink. These habitats, very, very, very important. Uh, not just for the food sources they provide in the animal sense, or the rather services that the animals provide for these habitats for the other denizens. But the plants also very, very important, if not more important, heavily forge the basis of this whole thing. It, it, I, it cannot be understated how important they are. 
fallen or submerged trees and leaves um, create really crucial microhabitats, serve as cover or even food for a lot of larvae. The benthic macroinvertebrates that we mentioned previously, a lot of them feed on decaying plant matter that has fallen into the water. And algae is very important. A lot of people don't know this, but they produce an insane amount of oxygen in the water, more than any plant combined, pretty much. Pretty insane, very, very important. And then as I mentioned sort of previously with the pythonotary warbler, riparian zones, very important for a lot of different species. You have the, the uh, riparian plants, like the jack in the pulpit, skunk cabbage, uh, cardinal flower, skunk cabbage, very, very common this time of year, you'll see the flowers coming up. These plants serve as food, uh, nectaring sources for a lot of creek denizens, very, very crucial as well for maintaining soil structure and stream health. They hold the soil together in a lot of different ways, these sorts of small plants. Um, and of course we have the aquatic plants that you'll see directly in the creeks. It depends on how fast or slow they're flowing, what, what plants you'll find. Um, you'll, you'll typically find them very close to the water, in the water, that sort of thing it depends on the species. Uh, but they're very important. Uh, important oxygen producers serve as very crucial cover for eggs and larvae of many creek denizens, including macroinvertebrates that we mentioned. As you can uh, tell, the macroinvertebrates are a, I've said the word important countless times, but <laughs> that's a very good word for describing these habitats. Now, you also have herbivorous water birds like ducks and geese that will eat these aquatic plants, especially in the winter. I know winter is coming to a close, but these aquatic plants were very, very important in the winter for feeding our good old ducks and geese. You have plants like water milfoil, pondweed, various cresses, uh, aquatic grasses, plant roots, also favorite. Now, you might be looking at this thinking, why is fungi on here? That makes no sense. And to that I say, well, I understand where you're coming from, but in a lot of ways, fungi are also very, very crucial, unexpectedly so, for these habitats. Um, they maintain the ecosystem health in some more abstract ways. They sort of help, uh, they help a lot of these plants that we, these riparian plants, survive. It's a lot to get into at the moment, but um, they form what are called mycorrhizal relationships with a lot of these uh, to help their, their um, hosts. I don't know if hosts is the more correct term necessarily, but they work together. It's symbiotic. They really help all these plants thrive further than they, than they could without their fungal symbionts. Uh, so the mycelium itself of the fungi also very important for maintaining soil structure as was plant roots. But these are, uh, the, the, what's the word? <laughs> Just had it a second ago. The mycelium of a lot of these fungi are very, very frequently found in soil grains, very important for keeping soil together. And as I mentioned earlier, you have groups like russulas, morels, chanterelles, boletes that are mycorrhizal. They form relationships with plants as small as tiny shrubs, um, tiny flowering plants to large trees. I would highly recommend reading more into it. It's very, very fascinating, their, their importance. And they're also great bioindicators. Um, and serve as food sources for a few of our creek denizens like raccoons and box turtles, which are both frequent visitors to these areas. So now that we've gone over the life in general, it's important to sort of go over the, 
the logistics per se of what makes these creeks so important on a on a more practical level, I suppose you could say, um, or not practical, but useful to us, uh, providing ecosystem services to us and their importance in that manner. So you have the Maryland Biological Stream Survey, as seen here, the um, index of biotic integrity circle down there at the bottom. You combine that to uh, the fish IBI and the benthic IBI to get a solid average rating for how healthy a creek is out of five. So we have a few, you know, here's how it generally looks. They visit a plethora of streams and creeks across the state. Um, every location is surveyed in the spring and the summer of a given year. There's the combined uh, index of biotic integrity down there. So in order to sort of better communicate my point here. Let's go over some popular creeks that you may have walked past or that you may know of in Howard County, such as Tiber Run, which is directly crossing through Ellicott City. You can see circled on the right there, you've got rosy side dace, like we saw earlier, good species. Uh, and you've got on the far right, another green circled species. Green represents pollution intolerant, yellow moderately tolerant of pollution, and green is very, I'm sorry, green, red is very pollution tolerant. And you can see on the left there, these sort of data going from 2010 to 2014, the combined uh, index out of five, again, as the rating, it fluctuates a lot. It doesn't really stay the same. And then you have another example of Meadowbrook Park, which many of you have also probably been to. Uh, you have Red Hill Branch. So this is another example of a more fluctuant creek. You have Rosy Side Dace there again. You have a few um, green benthic macro invertebrates on the right again. But yeah, in as you can see, in 2015, so you had the rosy side dace, you had those two, but in 2016, the two they had previously in the previous year, the two benthic macroinvertebrates that are circled here, but aren't they're not present here. One year later, they just disappeared. There are rosy side dace there still. So that's sort of an interesting thing. Uh, and you may be sort of asking, well, what has really caused this? Maybe it was a a drought, this sort of a reduction in, in biodiversity, pretty much. Uh, but as you can see, sort of highlighted with that black bar down there from 2016, 2015 to 2017, it wasn't necessarily a very intense drought period. So that's not likely the issue. The issue is that in 2015, there was 50% embeddedness. And in 2016, that bumped up to 100% which embeddedness is not a very good thing. It's the level of, of mud that is covering mud or loose sediment that's covering rocks on the bottom of the creek. Now, you might be wondering where I'm probably getting with all this, uh, but hear me out. I <laughs> uh, just want to keep explaining. And so you have, you know, what, what could have caused this embeddedness, of course. Uh, the common consensus is that anthropogenic climate change is causing record amounts of rainfall. Uh, as you know, in 2016, we did get a lot of rain. That was the Ellicott City flood. Uh, caused a lot of stream bank erosion in the summer. Uh, rainfall gets channeled into these streams via impervious surfaces like concrete. It all goes into the streams and creeks eventually. And it causes a lot of erosion and high embeddedness, which negatively impacts a lot of really crucial stream biota. Because when the sediment is caked over the rocks, 
it, you can't have benthic macro invertebrates really having a good time hanging out under rocks. And then that also, be, when, when there's even a little bit of disturbance, you have all that loose substrate, that loose mud that's, that's caking the rocks. It just gets, gets pulled everywhere in the water column when there's even a little bit of disturbance. And that's just not good for the creek's health can cause it to, to uh, go down a lot. So this area did improve a little bit uh, during 2017, but the biodiversity is still lower than 2015. So it seems to have maybe some other issues. Uh, it would be worth looking into further, but again, this is just an example. And you have, uh, on the other hand, a example of a non-fluctuant creek, very stable. You see those numbers there, again, out of five, very stable until it gets to about 2015, then it fluctuates a little bit. And you have a lot of green macroinvertebrates there and rosy side dace. Uh, and there's what, even West Friendship Park that Sue and I uh, surveyed ourselves. The last time MBSS surveyed there was 2002, but creeks can obviously, as they can also uh, deteriorate, deteriorate over time, they can improve a lot over time. And this is one example at West Friendship Park, we caught a lot of species uh, that MBSS did not catch and including crayfish. They did not catch any crayfish back in 2002. Uh, we caught five, five fish species that they did, that they did not catch. Um, very interesting. So of course the, <clears throat> the water quality can go up and the biodiversity can follow suit. So yes, the, the issues with all of this, is eventually ties to obviously humans as you could probably assume by now. And trash is also another big issue. Uh, it's very imperative to remove trash. Trash is such a big problem in these habitats. Huge contributor of diminishing creek and stream health. Um, if you find any creeks or streams with significant amount of trash, please contact um, Project Clean Stream, report the problem, volunteer uh, in their cleanup efforts as well. But yes, humans, we, we do obviously benefit from these habitats heavily. We benefit from the ecosystem services that they provide, um, you know, lots of life as we have detailed important food sources for us. You have a lot of fish that we can catch and eat. You have a lot of plants um, that are often harvested. Uh, and there's just a lot of sort of large scale services that these ecosystems provide that I can't necessarily get into here. Uh, but the biggest issues faced by these habitats, uh, these smaller creeks and streams, is really habitat disturbance and habitat loss. Now these all form, these are all a part of a larger watershed, they eventually all funnel into the Chesapeake Bay, all part of the estuary system. So even these smaller areas, even if they're destroyed, or tampered with, it can really cause some, some ripple effects, some, some undesirable to really, really destructive ripple effects in these habitats, depending on their importance. But you get the idea. Uh, protecting even these small areas is really, really important. They all feed into the rivers uh, and wetlands, of course as we detailed previously, all the animals, all the amphibians, all the fish, they just need these environments to be as healthy as possible. So uh, we just can't get complacent now. We have to, uh, we have to strengthen our protection efforts. They're obviously proven to work. 
as was seen here. They can improve. So we just need to spread the word. We need to teach people. We need to volunteer, report pollution, pick up trash, uh, survey for anything rare, anything, keystone, indicator species, minimize your disturbance as well, uh, minimize your carbon footprint, try to disturb these areas as, as least as you can. Because as I've said many times, and is obvious by now, these are uh, very, very crucial for the entire state, really, when you get down to it. So with that, I suppose that's the end. Thank you for listening. Uh, there's still so much to talk about. I could drone on for on, on and on, um, but these, these time constraints obviously couldn't allow that in the presentation. Uh, I hope this presentation expanded your appreciation overall viewpoint for these habitats. I do hope I taught you something new. Uh, so I'll just leave you with that. Thank you so much for listening. Emilio, I was thinking that we could use your expertise at the new shorebird habitat because of course we need the invertebrates for the shorebirds oh, yeah. to eat. <laughs> Right, those are of course very important. I only kept it to the the Piedmont of of Howard. Um, so of course, shorebirds very very heavily rely on invertebrates as well. Would so, love to help out with that. That'd be great. Yeah, so I've never done anything like that. Neither have we. So, <laughs> so if you there you go, <laughs> we'll both learn. <laughs> Join us. Um, let us. Are you a member of the Howard County Bird Club? Uh, I might be. I'm not sure. Okay. Well, contact um, me and uh, let me know if you're interested in joining us on the 20th um, for uh, over the procedures and where to park and where to go and everything, or if you want to mm -hmm. participate in the Zoom meeting. Will do. You'd have a lot to add. So at this time, we can open it up to questions for anybody. You can unmute, or if you don't feel comfortable with that, you can use the chat. Just, just a comment, aquatic moths, who knew? <laughs> yeah. So I certainly learned something. Well, that's good. Very happy. <laughs> Emilio, um... And those aquatic moths, um, they're fairly common, wouldn't you agree? Yeah. I mean, uh, when um, you and I yeah. surveyed uh, last yeah. summer, we, we saw quite a lot. Yeah. It, it wasn't an, an, an insane diversity. I believe it was only three, two or three, maybe four species. It, it depends, on, <clears throat> depends on habitat, but we saw those a lot. Where, where did you collect them? It was um, the South Branch, South Branch, Patapsco, right at the border of Howard and Carroll. Yep. So on a major stream, uh, like I have a small stream that runs out behind my house and, and I periodically uh, hang out a full arc lamp and mm. sheet and all that stuff. And uh, I don't believe I've recorded those puppies yet. Um, remember the field class I did back in the spring uh, for a small group to show you a new place, the Hoochins property? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the place. We did our surveys there all summer, every two weeks. Hoochins. Um, Emilio, mm -hmm. I'm surprised that bluebirds eat snakes. Yeah. Are they really small snakes, baby snakes? Yeah, like uh, there's small species like um, like ringneck snakes and de decays brown snakes are a are a very popular food for them. But I've seen photos of them carrying off small snakes. It's pretty crazy to think that a a bluebird so innocent looking would would do something like that. But so they do. Will they opportunists pick it apart, or does I, it go down all at once like a fish? Uh, well, I'm not really so sure about that, actually. Huh. I, haven't, I haven't looked into how they actually go about eating it. 
I don't, they, they shouldn't, I would, I would assume that they don't pick it apart. They don't really have the beaks for that. So they probably try to, in some ways, uh, kill it by smacking it, uh, smacking it against a tree um, and then maybe swallowing it whole. I don't know. They don't really have the, have the beaks or the behavior for, for picking at things, really. They, they usually swallow things whole. If I'm wrong, someone please correct me. <laughs> well, I don't know if anybody else knew that Ubers hate snakes, so. <laughs> <laughs> Well, great. I've taught you that. Uh, yeah. And uh, the, the, the vultures, too. Oh, yeah. Black do vultures. they kill the aquatic things? Or yeah. do they? Wow. Yeah, they'll often, uh, they, they've been seen fishing, eating turtles, snakes along the borders of, of these habitats. They, they won't necessarily go in the water, but they'll, they'll catch small things from the bank. Pretty cool. Um, Emilio and, and all. Um, so today I was along the Ciano Canal and I was um, the chorus of spring peepers and wood frogs. There were birds all around them. Um, birds oh, I would yeah. expect like the kingfisher, the red shouldered hawk, but there was a black vulture and it was down on the ground on the bank. And I, honestly, I know it's a big bird. I didn't see it until it took off. I obviously started right. or something and I was like, oh, what's it doing down there? So I didn't notice if it had actually taken anything, but I'll bet it was trying to get a frog. They were everywhere. Probably. Yeah. I would love to see that. That'd be cool. Yeah. I wish I had done a video. I didn't. Oh, well. <laughs> Maybe this spring we'll see that. <laughs> yeah. I have a, a comment from Roshan saying he caught the adults of the aquatic moths at his black light. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah, I would, I would expect, Roshan, you are um, quite the moth expert for your age. I've seen a lot of your, um, your uh, identifications on iNaturalist as well. Very impressive. And we you know have... more than I do about moths. <laughs> <laughs> and we have a comment. Um, what happens to or question? What happens to the biology when a hard rain washes out a stream like in uh, Font Hill? Uh, very similar sort of thing that I mentioned with Ellicott City. When you just have a lot of rain, it it disturbs all the sediment. It messes with everything. Um, depending on the health of the stream, it can cause a lot of erosion, stream bank erosion. If it's a healthy stream. Then it won't cause it won't cause much, but but heavy rain is is a big is a big deal for these habitats, and it's it's a shame that they're they're starting to become more frequent now. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, they can they can really affect these places negatively, but they can also be positive. Obviously, the, the wetlands that I mentioned, that the ephemeral wetlands can be filled up quicker, um, or they can be replenished, you know? It, it's, it, there, there's two sides to everything, really. Yeah, hi, this is Woody. I have a, some information. Mm. Are you with me? Can yeah. you hear me? Okay, yep. so I just wanted to mention that um, a couple of years ago, the county did a major stream restoration on the Davis branch at Mount Pleasant. Mm -hmm. uh, they completely restored about oh, 300 yards of stream bank and reconnected it with its uh, floodplain. I don't know if you've been there or not, I but if, not. You haven't, if you haven't, you ought to stop out. Uh, let me know. I'll take you down there one day. Uh, it's That'd really changed, changed that stream dramatically. But I wanted wow. to mention to everybody that I uh, just got information today that the Chesapeake Stormwater Network has named the Davis Branch Restoration Project a first prize in the stream restoration category for the best urban BMP award. Wow. So it's uh, that that stream has dramatically changed from what it used to be. So just wanted to pass that information along. And again, Emilio, if you want to uh, if, if you want to go and take a look at that, I'd be happy to take you down there anytime. So that'd be great. Yeah. Just uh, just let me know. It's Woody Merkel. You can find me on the uh, on the um, address list for the bird club. So, all right. 
contact me. <laughs> Sounds Thanks. great to me. Will do. All right, thank you. I can connect you also, Amelia, with Woody. <laughs> yeah, great. Thanks, Sue. So. About uh, the stream habitats, sort of in general. I was walking today at the north end of uh, Lake Kitimacundi, mm -hmm. and they're doing stream, what they're calling restoration there. And it said, among the things we're doing is taking out dead and diseased trees. Is there some kind of formula for how much dead and diseased trees are healthful and necessary in a stream bank? And should Columbia Association, you know, how truly healthy does Columbia Association want their streams or how park-like and manicured do they need them? Mm. David, I believe that effort is to remove the uh, dead ash trees. Oh, and that makes sense. They have, they have put up announcements about removing said uh, around uh, Kitamakundi, but I, I would be, uh, that would be my guess. Well, yeah. it didn't say ash trees. Dead ed, ash trees are very important now, and we're seeing an expansion of redheaded woodpeckers in a lot of these stream valleys, strictly mm -hmm. due to dead ash trees. So, you know, it has to be reconsidered as to whether you just want to take out the ones that are going to fall on someone and kill them. You don't want to take out all the ones. This, this right. is Columbia. We are a very risk averse uh, county here. Yes. Mm. All Probably the is next as well. not being done particularly close to the path. Well, obviously, mm. if it's going to fall on someone or fall across the path, taking it out, but there's no sense going in and whacking out ones like they did in Rock Creek in Montgomery yeah. County that are in interior. That's just destroying habitat for birds and other right. organisms. There's a balance, of course. Depends on where they are, but they can be very important in a plethora of ways, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, unfortunately, a lot of people who make the decisions are not really cognizant of the environmental importance of dead and dying trees yeah yeah and decaying trees too which yeah. is absolutely necessary amelia Thanks we have a couple uh questions in the chat um all oh, right yeah we do you see them or do you want me to read them to you uh i can look at them uh, starting with family i think we're yeah. good uh there. project clean stream uh, there's plenty, plenty of local streams, I'm sure, uh, regardless of where you live in the state. Um, there's, there's a lot of people you can contact about it. Lots of volunteer work available. I'd highly recommend that. Uh, also, thanks for, I, I'm, I'm glad you thought it was a great talk. Uh, clearing up trash. Uh, yeah, tires and large piece of trash, very, very difficult for sure. Sue would know that uh, uh, for sure. Sue knows how difficult it is. Um, but it, it takes, it can take a lot of volunteers, a lot of resources to sort of remove those tires. If it's a bad, a really bad problem, then again, you contacting Project Clean Stream would be a good sort of thing to, to do so you could get a lot of volunteers out to help clean it up. Otherwise, it's a, it's a big, it's a big uh, task for, for just one or even two people to take up. So that's, that's where you would have to sort of contact um, some more experienced, not necessarily experienced, but you know what I mean, an <laughs> uh, in, in avenue that can provide more people to help, like Project Clean Stream, or even uh, other, maybe the DNR or some other, some other branches <clears throat> of the county government uh, in this sort of field. Howard County has done Project Clean Stream for over a decade, led by me. Um, I'm retiring, oh. and I'm not sure the future of our participation. Um, mm. um, and yes, tires are a problem. If you have more than five tires to haul to a landfill, then it requires a permit from the Maryland Department of the Environment. You know, and the 
requires a trailer and everything to haul. We do have a site, um, Easter Route 1, that we can pull 100 tires a year out of it. it takes a, a lot of effort to coordinate that. Yeah, for sure. Uh, here's another question. Ah, uh, beavers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not personally sure of how much work is being done with sort of encouraging beaver beavers to, you know, do their thing. They are a keystone species, very, very important. Um, I did briefly, well, I don't think I actually mentioned beavers. I should have mentioned beavers. <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm not sure. Does anyone else here sort of know more about the work that's been done with beavers in this, in this county, sort of encouraging them? Because they are very, very important, more, more than people realize. Yeah, hi. This is Woody again. Right. Um, I know on the Davis Bridge restoration, right before they started the restoration, there was a beaver dam on it. And they took the beaver dam out to do the restoration. Mm -hmm. And within a few weeks after they did the restoration, mm -hmm. there's a beaver dam back on it. And oh. <laughs> right now there's three different beaver dams on that section of the river. Now they didn't do that purposely, but the beavers are there. And they actually have added to the wetland development in that section of the branch so huh. it wasn't anything done on purpose they just happened to be there <laughs> okay well <laughs> cool. anybody else on the beavers i think what i've heard in the county is that uh, at least in, 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 in columbia, columbia they discourage beavers, discourage beavers. Hmm. So we have them at Mount Pleasant, Alpha Ridge, Centennial, Kittimacwandi, uh, Middle Paducent uh, Environmental Area, where I think they're doing fairly well in the county uh, and uh -huh. not necessarily uh, being uh, interfered with it. And uh, what I saw at Alpha Ridge two days ago is when they create that environment, they bring in other animals like wood ducks and whatnot tend to oh, thrive yeah. in that. Uh, that mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, even when you have, that, that's another example when you have a, when you have a, a very heavy have, rain that washes, uh, that, that brings the stream levels super high, can even wash some, some fish and invertebrate species into those beaver ponds and create little habitat there. So they're very important for that as well. Very interesting that they're at Alpha Ridge. I did not know that. I've been meaning to go there, but I, I haven't seen a dam or anything. Anyway. I was surprised when I went there yesterday and it's uh, it's pretty impressive. They've got quite a little network there that uh, Bonnie Ott noted and then I chased wow. it down. It's uh, pretty. Huh. They're at Fontaine as well. Well. You can get beavers uh, with bank uh, dens in their bank in the bank too. If you have a stream that's too flashy, so they uh, so the dams get destroyed. They'll build uh, their dams or their dens in the bank. Mm. Bank beavers. <laughs> and, and when you look at beavers, macro invertebrates, bank beavers. <laughs> yeah. they do do it. <laughs> right, right. Do it on Northwest wait, Branch, wait. for example. Yeah. You'll see uh, you look all at these macro... cut down trees, but you won't see any beaver dam. See any beaver dam. Yeah. Huh. yeah. I wish I knew more about beavers. <laughs> I wish I knew more about beavers. <laughs> when, when you look at macro invertebrates, when uh, they create those dams and whatnot, those snags create more habitat for macro invertebrates, which means more food for the uh, for the food chain. So it's oh, yeah. uh, it, it's a healthy thing for the environment. From one. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, more, more healthy than unhealthy for sure. Yasu? 
I'll make a very brief comment about beaver. Um, without a doubt, they create wonderful wetland habitat as has been noted, but I work for the county, um, all agencies, whether it's Columbia Association, perhaps your homeowners association, when beaver get into sediment ponds that have control structures for flooding or whatever, um, beaver are a problem. They can be, right. some would probably consider them a nuisance. Of course. Um, you know, 100 years ago, beaver were, you know, brim. Now beaver are everywhere. You trap a beaver out, a new one moves in. It's a never ending, it's, it's a problem sometimes. I love beaver, don't get me wrong. I'm not the beaver manager at Howard County Rec and Parks, but mm. uh, I believe them, um, there is a policy probably on our website about beaver management. And um, you know, if everybody might wanna have a program on beavers and management, who knows? Hey, so what, what, what's the problem with sediment ponds and beavers? What do they do that's um, problematical? They, they, they will take mud and try to dam up the, uh, like that structure that all the, the water flows down in, you know, that cement structure. Uh, if they block that up and then the function of the pond doesn't work and they can cause flooding. Mm. Um, and, you know, I hate to, I shouldn't get into this. This is a big subject. Um, that's all I'll, I'll say. That's all I'll, I'll say. Okay. Any more questions? I think I've gone through everything in the chat. Say goodbye. Bye bye. Oh. All right. <laughs> I think Greg was about trying to say something a bit ago. If you want to say something. Thank you. Okay. Amelia. Goodbye, all. It was a Dave pleasure Dave. to present. It was a lot of fun. I'm glad y'all enjoyed it. Learned something new. <laughs> yeah, thanks very much. Enjoyed it. A lot of new yeah. stuff. Very informative. Good, good. I'm glad. Thanks, and get out in the field. Enjoy the birds and the other wildlife. Oh, yeah. Enjoy the spring. Thank you. Uh,